Good evening. It is June the 8th, 2022, and this is your amazing Westbury Midweek Bible Study. Now, we started last week uh, on, a, on a lesson that had to do with guilt and grace, and uh, we're doing a series on grace. We talked the first couple of weeks about saving grace, and, and now we're talking about guilt and grace, you know, because I think I have more trouble with guilt than any other emotion. I feel guilty about everything and uh, you know when I was in school the teacher would say there were some of you in this test that didn't do as well as you should I you know okay I'm guilty I probably did even if I got a hundred which wasn't that which wasn't that often uh, and so last week here's where we concluded that uh, that we had some tests to find out whether uh, guilt was of God or guilt was of the devil um, and, uh, and we finished up with, on the third test, is the focus on rules or relationships. Um, it, you know, when, when we struggle with genuine guilt, the, the question that runs through our mind is, did I hurt somebody? Um, when we study with, or when we struggle with false guilt, uh, the overwhelming feeling is, you know what, I broke the rules. I, I'm not worthy. And, uh, and so how, what are we going to do about it? How do we handle guilt? That's number two on your outline, uh, if you want to follow along. How do you handle guilt? Because what do we do when the dashboard light goes on in our life? You're driving down the road and your dashboard light comes on and some people just ignore it and some people panic. I, I have not seen a vehicle in Mexico that didn't have the check engine light on it and uh, on. And, uh, and, and so they, your check engine light's on not going to worry about it. And, and so and so what do we do when the warning light comes on? Well, let me give you three common ways we have of dealing with guilt. And I want you to know that these three ways go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Okay, so we're not talking about something light We're talk, or, or, or new. We're talking about something that's as old as time itself. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. It says, They sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. They hid from the Lord God. And when challenged by God, Adam said, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. She gave me some fruit of the tree, and I ate it. Okay, let's look at three, very quickly, three responses to guilt that we normally have. Number one is shame. Shame. We, we, we're ashamed. Uh, we just feel bad about it. And we think that if we feel bad about something for long enough, somehow it's going to be better. You know what? Shame doesn't work. Uh, Adam and Eve sewed fig leaves together to cover their shame. Were they still ashamed? Yeah. Why? It didn't work. Second response. Response number two is we hide. They hide. They hid in the bushes from God. Okay, now God's all those omni words, right? Omniscient, omnipotent. Do you think God could see them hiding in the good and in the bushes? Of course he could see them hiding in, in the bushes. Kind of look like kind of like putting tape over your dashboard over the light that's on, okay? You may not be able to see it, but it's still there. Third response is blame. So shame, hiding, and blame. Blame has not lost popularity over the years. In fact, blame is just getting more and more popular. You, you know, you, what you have here is you have Adam trying to avoid the blame and Eve trying to avoid the blame and the snake trying to avoid the blame. And God comes up to find out what happened and says, Adam, did you eat from that tree? And Adam took it like a man. That's right, he blamed his wife. And, and, and I mean, he didn't waste any time pointing the finger. She gave it to me. It was her fault. So what's Eve going to do? Well, Eve decides, well, if he's got pointing the finger at me, I'm going to point the finger at the, say, at the serpent. And I'm going to look at the serpent and I'm going to say, it's the serpent's fault. The serpent did it. So you have Adam blaming Eve and Eve blaming the snake. And the snake, bless his heart, didn't have a leg to stand on, did he? I'm sorry, that was too good to resist. Uh, it, it is easy to try to blame our way out of something that happens. The first um, car I ever owned, I inherited from my sister. It was a Volkswagen Beetle. And, uh, and, and I was driving it around. And one day I heard a noise from the back. And, uh, and so I thought, you know, I'd better call somebody. There was a place called, the, there was a VW shop that was a little bit cheaper than taking it to the, uh, to the, the dealer. And, and in my house, it was all about cheaper. And, uh, and so, so I called the guy and he said, uh, uh, he said, well, you know, you, you might want to bring it by to take a look. So I brought it away. It was a big bang I heard. And, uh, and, and so you know, I'd stopped the car and went around and didn't see anything wrong. So I, 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 I went to the, I went to the dealer and, and he came around and said, uh, 
you know, this sounds like it could be big trouble. Um, this was after I'd called him. I had a payphone. They didn't have cell phones back then. I had a payphone called him. And, uh, and, uh, and so, so he said, you should bring it by here. And all right, I'll bring it by there. As I was driving, I remembered, you know, just a little bit further down the road, there was a guy who didn't specialize in Volkswagens, but he specialized in car mechanic, and he was a lot cheaper. In fact, he went to church uh, with us, and my father had baptized him, and so he was a lot cheaper. And uh, and so I'm gonna, I, I am going to to go a, an extra five miles and go to that place. A couple of minutes later, heard a big bang. Uh, another big bang and uh, and the back tire the back tire fell off of the car while I was driving it I don't know if you've ever had that sensation before of being passed by a by a tire that is supposed to be on your vehicle but that is not a good feeling now here's the question from that story what do we do when the wheels of life fall off and we're cruising along and also we hear a bang we look around and say ah, I don't see anything too bad and we look and then all the wheels have fallen off you know, what do we do? Because shame and hiding and blame, it just doesn't work anymore. So what we need to do is we need to go to to God's way of handling guilt. That's Roman numeral number three uh, on your outlines, God's way of handling guilt. Now, here's God's way of handling guilt. It's summed up in one single word, grace. That's God's way of handling guilt. Here's 1 John 1, nice. Memorize it. Say it every day of your life. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So God has a three-part recipe, a three-part formula, a three-part prescription for dealing with guilt. Number one is confess your sins. It's saying to God, I did it and, and you need to know about it. Not just our fears, not just our frustrations, not just our problems. Confess our sins. Now, what does the word sin mean? Because there's a lot of fancy definitions of sin out there. So what does the word sin mean? Well, for me, the easiest and, and best way to define what sin is is just go to the word itself and look what's at the geographic center of the word sin, and it is the letter I. See, sin is when we get all wrapped up in ourselves. It's saying, excuse me, God, I know what you want, but I believe I'm going to go ahead and live life the way I want to live it, not the way you want to live it. So, uh, And so you, we'll just go with it from there. That's kind of like me looking at my car and saying, you know what, it looks okay to me, so I'm going to keep on driving. And you can come to church absolutely every time the doors open, or you can never grace the doors of a church building and still have the eye problem in the middle of our lives and leave God out. Now, that's what sin's all about. So here's how we confess our sins. Number one, tell God. I mean, tell him. God already knows, but God needs to know we know. And before he can do something about it, you see, when it comes to sin, we either fess up or we cover up. And, and, uh, and so Psalm 69, 5, you know, my foolish sin, O God, my guilt is not hidden from you. And we agree, God, this is what I did was wrong and you are right. And we tell God when we pray to God and God's going to listen. That scripture I just read to you in first John is a guarantee of that. Then the second thing we do is tell a trusted friend, James 5, 16, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Now, this is a necessity. You mean I have to confess my sin to somebody else? Not if you don't want to be healed. But if you want to be healed, Scripture's pretty clear. It will never feel free from the guilt of the sin until we share that sin with somebody. Because there's something healing about getting it out on the table. There's something healing about that. It takes that sin that seems so big in the dark and it shrinks it down to the size of, well, you know, I think this is something we can deal with. It brings it down to a size that we can chew. Now, I am not a mind reader, but I know that you, we've got folks out here thinking, you know what? I've confessed this sin to God and I've confessed this sin to a trusted friend a bunch of times. I mean, enough times where the friend's saying, okay, don't, you don't have to do this anymore. And I still feel guilty. Well, if that's you, let's go on to step two. And step two is trust God's character. 
Because if we confess our sins without really knowing who God is, without really understanding that God forgives those sins, we're not going to find a release from those sins. 1 John 1, 9 says God is faithful and God is just. That means we can count on him. I can count on God for his faithfulness. Now, a whole lot of us feel like we don't, we're not allowed to get close to God because we, feel, because we don't feel forgiven. And that is where Satan comes in and steals the show from us. That is a trap from the devil. The closer we get to God, the more forgiveness we feel. As long as we keep God at arm's length, the less forgiven we will feel. Hebrews 10, 22, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. The cross of Christ frees us from a guilty conscience. First time I ever went ice skating was in Lubbock, Texas. They had an ice skating rink called Winterland. It was on Slide Road. Uh, it's kind of where Slide and the Brownfield Highway from Lubbock, from Lubbock come together. Uh, and, uh, and we rode it was a church outing, and we rode in the bus, on the church bus. Now, I don't know whose idea it was to go ice skating, but it was somebody's idea to go ice skating. And, and basically, all the high school guys were in the back, and us eighth graders were up front. And the guys in the back started talking about how the last time they went ice skating, somebody fell and somebody was skating and didn't see them fall and skated over their finger. And those those blades on those ice skating those, uh, on, on skates are sharp enough to, to cut a tomato and they just slice that finger right off. And you could see him there at the church building uh, any Sunday. He didn't do much with the youth group anymore, but he was the guy that had the finger missing. And, uh, and they were talking about how gross it was and how easy it could happen. Can I tell you what it was like for an eighth grader on that particular, uh, on that particular youth activity? It, you know, those of us who did venture out on the ice never once let go of the rail around the ice. We, we, we were not going to fall. We, we needed our fingers. I was not going out into the middle of that skating rink. Now, that's how some of us deal with God's grace. So some of us deal with God's grace that with the idea that we know God's forgiven us, and, and uh, but we're afraid to let go of the rail around the edges of life. That's called legalism. You know, we know God forgives us, but it's kind of, I'm not going out there. You know, because it's dangerous. I don't know, it's risky. And, and so we hold on to those rules like that's the way to enjoy God. And a full knowledge of the rules doesn't help us enjoy anything. I challenge you, get out into the middle of the rink and enjoy the grace of God. You will not lose a finger. I promise you that. You're thinking, what if I fall? You're going to fall. I mean, you're going to fall. Folks that have been skating their whole lives, they still fall down. None of us are perfect. And God will pick you up and give you new strength. And the next time you strap the skates on, you'll skate a little bit further than you did. And, and, and because if we think that, uh, that, that, uh, that God wants us to hang on a rail the whole time we're out there, then, and, and it, then the, the, the cloud of guilt is never going to let go of us. God's grace is the only thing that lets us be all that God knows we can be. So get out in the middle. Skate on out there. I, I've decided that I need, I need a different hobby. Uh, I'm, I, I, I read now for a hobby, and I love reading, reading copious amounts of books. Um, uh, one of the elders at Champions asked me to send him a list of books. I like to read biographies and autobiographies to, to send me a list of my favorites. Well, it just so happens that two of my top ten are one's by Dusty Rhodes, The American Dream, The Wrestler, and the other's by Ric Flair, The Wrestler. They're really good books. Uh, and uh, I mean, they're told, they, they tell it straight, they tell it like it is. Sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's tragic. Um, but I'm at the point where I probably need to not read so much and get out and do a little bit more. And I think, well, what would you like to do? What would you like to do? So I went out and joined the Athletic Officials Association, and I wouldn't mind umpiring girls softball. And uh, I, I'm not interested in umpiring little league. I'm not interested in umpiring high school baseball. I'm not interested in I'm not interested in in, in any 
where you have amped up coaches and testosterone flowing all over the place. And now I, you know, just something that you enjoy the fun and, and, and you have a good time of it. Um, I could stay, stay close to the rail and keep reading. And I don't imagine I'll stop reading much. I could stay close to the rail and keep reading, but I've decided that, you know what? I'm going to skate out to the middle, which brings us to number three, and that is to accept God's forgiveness. Look back at John chapter one, verse nine. It says, and God will purify us from all, not some, not most, all unrighteousness. What an important three-letter word about grace, the word all. John 3, 18, whoever believes in him, Jesus, is not judged guilty. All right, so if God has freed us and we don't feel free, maybe the issue is we're not forgiving ourselves. Maybe somebody did something to hurt us way back there and they've asked us to free them and we have it. You see, the Bible tells us we don't free people from uh, from what they've done to us because we don't feel free. You know, the, the answer is us. Psalm chapter 32, 5. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave, oh, listen to this, I like this, the guilt of my sin. The sin wasn't in question with David. David knew God had forgiven him of the sin. A devil's struggle with the guilt of the sin. Now, do we have the right to hold something against somebody that God's already freed? No, no, we don't. If God's freed them, they are free. And when we hold it against them, then we become shackled to the sin and the guilt sin brings. Now, I want you to know that is strong, but it needs to be said. So if you're watching this and the guilt in your heart is eating you up, it does not have to just by accepting the wonderful grace of Jesus. If you're not a member of the Lord's church, if you're not a member of the church of Christ, you need to be baptized and, uh, and have your sins washed away and, and you'll come out new. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you right now. We thank you for, Father, so many blessings. Father, I think the greatest blessing that we have right now is you're so patient. And so, Father, we know you're so patient because, because there are still folks out there that are hungry for your word. And so we ask that you, that you help us find those people. Father, on our part, let us never stop searching for those who need you in the worst way. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a good week.